graduated from the School of Business in 2005 with a major in accounting. And uh, after that, he started actually started his career here in Logan for the Beneficial Financial Group. Is that correct? And then uh, with the with uh, moved to Boise, and then now he's back down in Alpine, Utah, um, and he's now the the president and CEO of Mass Mutual, the Intermountain Division. Um, Brady uh, really is an, an active person. He uh, he's run nine. He, you've, you've participated in nine Ironman competitions, which is incredible in my, in my mind. And uh, as well as he uh, also founded Rods Racing, which I'm sure he'll talk more about tonight. Without further ado, we'll invite Brady to come. Speak. All right. Let's do a, a mic check. You guys all right? Everybody in the back? This is surreal for me to be here because I have never actually been here. I've always been there half asleep. And so I'm going to try and keep you guys awake tonight. A um, lot, of, lot of fun to be able to come back here to Utah State. Um, as was said, I grew up in Preston, Idaho. I'm curious, any Napoleon Dynamite fans here? <laughs> Woo! You know it. That's my hometown. Those are my roots right there. And so I'm sure I'll be able to work in a little Napoleon Dynamite throughout the evening. Um, I have a very, very deep appreciation for Utah State. And it's, it's an honor to get to be back here with, with you. Uh, the students at Utah State, I've been all over the state. I've recruited from all different universities throughout the state. And I'm telling you, bar none, the, U the students at Utah State are the most well-rounded and, in my opinion, the most prepared to enter the workforce. And that's a credit to the hard work that you work or that you put into yourself and, and to your studies, but also our incredible professors that had a profound impact on my career uh, uh, over the last 10 years. So let's jump into this. I want to make this fun. I want to make this informative. And I hope that you walk out that door with a better vision on what you can become in your career and in your life, both on and off the field. Okay, I'm going to start out uh, start out with just some basic principles before I jump into my story about Rod's racing. First and foremost, um, I believe that there's a lot of different things that motivate us, and I believe that we're all governed by laws. And so, if I say the law of the harvest. That's basically you reap what you sow. Right. And we say, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of different laws that are out there. Let's just jump right to the laws of the land. If you don't follow the laws of the land, what happens? Anybody know this? Right. You typically speed. You get higher car insurance unless you have GEICO because of the gecko. Right. That's the law of the land. I'm going to talk to you about the law of desire. The law of desire, which states that that which you desire most, you always get. That which you desire most, you always get. And that's where I'm going to start my story. As I said, I graduated from Utah State in 2005. It was here at Utah State where I actually, yes. Oh, we got a. A microphone in Tooele is going AWOL. <laughs> <laughs> and I can see who it is. <laughs> I thought it was me. I kept kicking the desk. I'm like, I shouldn't make that sound. All right. And so back to, uh, back to the law of desire and where this, start, with the, where this whole journey starts. Um, my story starts uh, with, be with beating, how did that work out? With meeting my beautiful wife. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're going to end as I go to jail. Okay. <laughs> I met Andrea here at Utah State. Ironically enough, one of our first dates, actually our very first date was an Aggie basketball game. Our second date was going to a special needs dance where I didn't like that so much because I didn't get a dance with Andrea at all that night because <laughs> she was a very popular partner that night for all those that were attending there. 
I remember my wife and I talking about adoption. We talked about orphans. We talked about Down syndrome before we were even married. Okay? And I believe that going back to the law of desire and this that idea of that which we desire most, we receive. Now, at the time, we had no idea what the future was in, what was in store for us in the future. But we did know that there was things that were important to us that we wanted to be able to be involved in. Okay? Fast forward a few years, I got my dream job. I got dream opportunities within this career. We had a beautiful daughter, and we had just moved to Boise, or we were getting ready to move to Boise uh, for another career opportunity, which was incredible within the same industry, within the same company. We were expecting our second child, and it was going to be my son. And so as any father knows, your daughters, they have your heart, right? But your sons, there's something special that you have for those sons. You have an idea of what they can accomplish in their life. Growing up in Preston, it was a requirement that if you're male and if you could walk, you're required to play baseball, football, and basketball. Otherwise, they wouldn't have a team, right? <laughs> and so sports were a big part of my life growing up. Sports were a really big part of my life growing up. And I had these visions of what it could be like for my son and what it was going to be like for my son. Finally, the night came, or the day came, when it was time for us to go to the hospital, right? It's kind of funny how this worked out. We had just moved into a brand new house, okay? We were so excited about this. It was our dream house. Our very first night in our home, my wife woke me up at about 2.30 in the morning and said those famous words, I think it's time. So I'm fired up, and I jump out of bed, and I'm like, let's do this. Here we go. All right, where's the bags? I know we're prepared for this. And she said, just... Just give me a little bit of time, and, and, and just let's just wait. Go ahead and go take a shower, and uh, it's going to be a long day, so just get ready. So I go jump in the shower. I come back out, and my wife is just dying in pain. Like, she's just, like, full-on labor, right? And she said the next famous words that I didn't want to hear, and that was, I think I waited too long to go to the <laughs> hospital. I immediately went into Boy Scout mode. I ran straight to the garage, I grabbed my headlamp and my Leatherman and got ready to deliver this kid, <laughs> right? I came back in and luckily it was a contraction and it had passed. We made it to the hospital. Andrea did a wonderful, wonderful job in the delivery. And before I knew it, there he was. My son, my first son, and all those dreams and visions for what I wanted for my son was just flashing before my eyes, right? And I'm like a proud dad taking pictures and high-fiving the kid and obviously throwing him in the air and catching him and everything you do with a newborn baby, right? <laughs> and, uh, and you get out a little bit further and, and uh, we go about 10 minutes into this and the room, the doctors and the nurses were just quiet and they were kind of whispering back and forth to one another. And then the doctor came and he put his arm around me. He said, Brady, we think that your son has Down syndrome. And, uh, and it just changed. It changed a lot of what I envisioned for my son at that time, right? It, just, it was just different. And it wasn't bad and it wasn't good. It was just different. And I was grasping and I was trying to get my arms around that. And I, I still am upset at myself for even thinking this, but I remember not wanting to tell my wife and feeling like that was a huge burden that I had on my shoulders, that I had to go tell my wife that just went through labor that our son has Down syndrome. Well, I went over to her and I was very emotional and I leaned down and just very close, I whispered in her ear and I told her what the doctor just told me. And she didn't skip a beat. It didn't change anything for her. And they handed her the baby, and she was just like she would have been with any child. And for me, that created such a peace and such a comfort to know that 
this kid is here for a reason. And this is my boy, and I wouldn't change it for anything. I remember I left, and I went to dinner, uh, just like you do when you have your firstborn son. You and your dad go to El Sol, right? <laughs> have a little bit of lunch special, although it was dinner. And uh, I go walking into the restaurant, and there was a couple that was walking out of the restaurant. And I would guess that they're probably early 60s. And right behind them was a girl, a lady, that was probably 40, that had Down syndrome. And it hit me that that, that that's me, right? That this little buddy, he's probably not going anywhere. And that vision of the retirement and all those exotic hunting trips to Africa is different because I'm gonna have my little buddy there with me. And I loved that. I loved that aspect about it. So life continued, and we found out that, that Down syndrome is not a bad thing, as I said. It's actually a way cool thing. And this little guy became like the life of the party. Everywhere we would go, we would find that people just embraced him and loved him, and that they liked us more because we had a kid with Down syndrome. I don't know how that works, but it worked out good, right? And life just continued, and it continued, and, and things were good. Things were really, really good. I got to a point in my life where things were going great professionally. Things were going great uh, at home. Loved my kids. We had another son. Uh, his name's Ridge. He's just a little stud. He's great. He beats up on Nash all the time. I can't wait to make fun of him for beating up on his brother that has Down syndrome. <laughs> 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 and... Uh, and it, things were good. But I felt in my life that I needed to do more. I couldn't identify what that meant. I just felt a deep, deep desire that I needed to do more. And I needed to do it right now. I didn't know what that meant. And so I just went about in a lot of different ways trying to find out what that meant. Is it work harder? Is it spend more time with my kids? What is it? I need to do more. I had a conversation with a gentleman, ironically enough, that's in this room, in Mike Glauser. And I talked to him about this. And I said, I've got a desire to help and to be involved. I love this nonprofit idea. I hear that you have some experience in this. And he said, I wrote a book about this. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me, right? He said, you need to read this book. He said, you can find it on Amazon. Go buy it. So I found it, I bought it, and I read it. And it was called The Business of Heart. The Business of Heart. It talks about and teaches you how to run a business that's not your traditional business, but a business that is to help people. It's the business of heart. And I said, how cool would that be to get to be in a business setting, I'm an entrepreneurial guy, but with the end game being helping people. I continued to search and I looked and I looked for how I was gonna pull this off. And because that's what I desired most, that's what I found. Remember that law? One evening I was on the internet. I came across a website that had listed dozens and dozens of children who were, who were orphans who had Down syndrome. It struck me to the core. I'll show you a picture of what I was looking at. See if I can figure this thing out. Uh-oh, it went dead. There we go. Here we go. Let me show you guys a couple cool pictures real quick. Hey, hey, Aggies right there. That's Andrea. There's my little Nash boy. That's what he looks like now with his peanut butter and jelly face. You see this? This is what a happy, healthy, little Down syndrome boy looks like. This is what I saw that night. It struck me to my core. Because I saw these kids who were in this orphanage that didn't have a chance at life. And I knew what Nash did for me and I knew what these kids could do for a family. 
I didn't see this as an opportunity to help these kids. I saw this as an opportunity to help a family get to experience the blessing of having a child who has Down syndrome. And I went to work. I didn't know what it was going to be, but I started to research this out. And I found that the only thing standing in the way of these little kids getting adopted was the financial resources to pay for the adoption, that there were families all over the US that wanted to adopt these kids. They just didn't have 40 grand to pay for it, because that's how much international adoption costs. So I said, if money's the only thing that's standing in the way of these kids getting adopted, I can do something about that. I didn't know what that was, but I said, I'm going to choose one of these kids. <clears throat> I'm going to choose one of these kids, and we're going to fundraise for them, and we're going to help them. And you see that little picture of this guy up there? That's Eli. He was in Lithuania. It was Christmas of 2011. My wife and I said, let's start small. We're going to ask our parents if it's OK if rather than us buying presents for them and them buying presents for us, if we just donate that money to Eli. Our goal was to raise $20,000. So it started small, $50, $100 here, $50 there, and then miracles took place. I promise you, if you get caught up in a cause that is not about you, but that is about somebody else, miracles will take place. I promise. Within 30 days, $20,000 had been raised for that kid. He had been on this website for four years. The orphanage director said it herself. He was in a dark place, a black hole. He had no chance. $20,000 30 days later, he has a family, a family that committed to adopt him in Indiana. That's when he came home. That's what he looks like now. Now tell me that doesn't motivate somebody to do run through a wall or whatever it is, right? Which brings me to my next point. I said, I love this. This is amazing. i got to figure out a way to be able to raise more funding for these kids. And my wife said, well, you like triathlons. You've always wanted to do an Ironman. Why don't you do one of those? And let me give you my background with triathlons. The only reason I did triathlons before, and I did the little baby triathlons, where you like slide down this pool and then you ride the trike. And yeah, that's the type of triathlete that I was. The only reason why I did that is because I was like 32, 33, and my shirt size was medium husky. I wanted to try and lose a couple of LBs, and I needed to figure out a way to be able to do that, right? That was my motivation with triathlon. I remember I did my first one, and uh, I got to the end, and I thought I was going to die. Like, Seriously thought I was going to die. It was a, it was a 70.3 distance, a half Iron Man. And in fact, let me show you a picture of what I look like after that. It's pretty funny, actually. <laughs> there I was. <laughs> and I'm like dead. And I did a half Iron Man. So the thought of, at this moment, getting up and doing that all over again it's not happening, right? It's just not happening. And I had pretty much uh, convinced myself that an Iron Man was out of the table, or out, out of the picture. Well, my wife brought that up again. Before, I was doing an Iron Man for myself, so I could tell my buddies that I was an Iron Man, that I completed an Iron Man. That was my motivation. And you saw what the result was. This time, it was different because it wasn't about me, it was about these kids. And if me doing an Ironman meant that one of these kids got to come home, I would do an Ironman, period. Now, what an Ironman consists of, <clears throat> let me explain this, how crazy this is. It's a 2.4 mile swim, you get out and you jump on a bike, and you ride that bike 112 miles. And for your cool down, you run a marathon. <laughs> and you do that all in the same day without stopping. Yeah, I know. 
Um, it was wild. I mean, I, I couldn't even get my arms around what it would take to, to do this. But I committed because I knew of what it could do to help these kids. I didn't know how it was going to help them. I just, I actually got, jumped on Facebook and started emailing people, hey, I'm going to do an Ironman. Will you donate some money to help this kid out? And they're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it, we got some donations from that. Well, here we go. Let me talk to you a little bit about this training side of Ironman. Um, I had a full-time job. I was a full-time dad. And I didn't want to give either of those up from the standpoint of I work from 8 to 5, and I came home and had dinner with my family, and I didn't want to be out on my bike. And so I had to do all of my training before work, is what I figured out, right? Mm -hmm. And so the first thing that went was TV. Cable TV, TV in general was gone. The next thing that went is staying up past 10 o'clock, because <laughs> I had to get up very early, 4.30 each morning, six days a week. So that meant I had to go to bed at 9.30 to give me seven hours, because otherwise there's no way I was going to pull that off, which worked out good because my kids went to bed at like six. So <laughs> it worked out plenty good, right? We started to train. Uh, when I say we, meaning my kids, I'll show you another picture on this. My kids helped me a lot. Um, they were a big motivation for me. Uh, let's see here, right there, <laughs> this is a funny story. This is where I do a lot of my riding, it is upstairs on a trainer. This represents all of the nutrition that I had for one long ride, for a 100 mile ride, that's what I prepared. I have to drink a lot because I sweat a lot as you can see, okay, but this is the best part. You see Nash? holding that whole loaf of banana bread. I got up one morning at 4.30 to do a long training ride, and I went out, I turned the light on, and that kid's sitting there on the, on the couch with an entire loaf of <laughs> banana bread, eating it. And I looked at him, and he gave me that look like, don't even think about it. This is mine. I'm up at this hour, so you don't bother me. Go on, get on your bike, right? <laughs> and so... It's pretty fun, pretty fun to see him. Over the next months, it took me all year, there were 6,541 miles that I swam, biked, or ran to prepare for this. Remember what I said when I said that if you get caught up in a cause, that it is about helping others, that miracles would take place? Let me tell you about a miracle that took place. There's a lot of Ironman events that are out there. Anybody can sign up for these Ironman events, except for one Ironman, which is the Ironman in Kona, Hawaii. It's the Ironman World Championship. It's the World Series of Ironman events. All Ironman athletes have a desire to someday get to compete in the Ironman World Championship. The challenge with that is you've got to qualify to get in, or you've got to get a special invitation, which only comes to, like, if you're a Kennedy. Outside of that, <laughs> it's not happening, right? And so my plan was to do a different Ironman event. I was sitting in a Down Syndrome conference in Washington, D.C. when I got an email from a gentleman named Rob White. He said, you don't know me? but I've heard about your story. I, too, have a son with Down syndrome. I own a company that is the title sponsor for the Ironman World Championship this year. I want to invite you to participate in the Ironman World Championship, and we want to feature your story on NBC and tell the world about what you're doing. If you get caught up in a cause, miracles will take place. There's no way I could have planned that in signing up for an Ironman. But my heart was pure and the intentions were correct to help these kids. And miracles took place. My family and I went to Kona, Hawaii. It was a, 
It was a surreal experience. The whole week was wild because, you know, I had a lot of these NBC things going on, and I had to nail those. Like, I just felt a huge pressure that I had to nail those interviews because this was our key, right? Me doing the Iron Man's one thing, but it's those words that I'm going to communicate with the world about why I'm doing it. I've got to nail those. So there was a tremendous pressure, not to mention the fact that I had to do the 2.4, 112, and the marathon thing on the weekend. It was an incredible amount of pressure. I had an incredible support staff. The day of the race finally came. I didn't sleep hardly a wink the entire night. I got up, I went in, or I went to where they, they start, and I was immediately met with a camera. <laughs> no pressure, right? Like a big camera like that, even bigger, actually. <laughs> I also entered in where the Iron Man world champion from the previous year, Craig Alexander, was right in front of me. No pressure, right? I went out, we got ready. It was chaos all morning, right? The race starts at 7, the sun's coming up, it's just chaos. There's drums and they do all this Hawaii stuff. There's elite athletes throughout the entire world that are there. And finally it's time to start to funnel out and to get into the ocean to start this event. I swam out because you go out a little ways, and that was the first time that there was calm. It was just calm. And you just look in the eyes of these other competitors, and I love to compete, and I'm like, I'm going to take you down, right? <laughs> and, but it was calm, and we were all as a brotherhood, as a fraternity. We're all out there together, right? And as this calm was getting more and more calm, the anxiety continued to grow. And finally, there was a countdown, and there was a huge cannon that went off. And that call went away, and it was a war zone. It was crazy. Um, I'll show you a picture of the swim. I don't know if you've seen these mass starts before, <clears throat> but um, that, that's what it looked like. I was in there somewhere, <laughs> and you just start going. And you're just hammering down, and you're pushing, and the adrenaline's going, and you're just swimming out in the ocean, hoping a shark doesn't get you. A key to this is you actually want to get behind another athlete and pace off of them. You draft off of these individuals. It makes it easier. And I found somebody that was just a little bit faster from me than me right in the beginning, and I just stayed on their feet. As we were coming in at the very end, I actually was in a group of individuals, and there was an athlete right on the side of me that was in a hot pink swimsuit. And she kept trying to still the guy's feet in front of me, like move me over and get in position, right? And I'm thinking this is like some 23-year-old hotshot pro trying to take my athlete, right? Wasn't the case. We get out, I'm feeling good right here. I'm like, I just did the 2.4 mile swim. And I see the gal in hot pink. And she's probably 65. And she <laughs> smoked me, right? I'm like, really? I'm not the best swimmer, but I can hold my own on the bike, I'm telling myself. We move forward. We get on the bike. The bike is renowned for the wind and the heat and how relentless it is. This is positioned as the hardest Ironman triathlete or triathlon in the entire world because of the lava fields that you can see in the back, because of the wind. And it's not a tailwind, it's not a headwind, it's a crosswind, and that is a wild thing. Immediately out of the gates on the bike, I was only a couple miles in, and guess who I saw in front of me? I saw that hot pink gal, right? And so I did what any Ironman triathlete would do. I go by her and I gave her one of these, how you like me now, <laughs> as I kept on and just smoked her on the bike, right? I'm just kidding, I didn't do that. I would have, though, if I saw her. <laughs> and you go cruising, right? And the swim wasn't all that bad. The, the swim wasn't all that bad. But you get on the bike, and you start to fill it, right? And you get out 50, 60, 70 miles. And you start to think, after this, I've got to run a marathon. Yeah. <laughs> your mind starts playing games with you. It does. It starts telling you things like, you don't have to do this, right? 
He starts telling you things like, just slow down and stop for a little while. Isn't that like life? Isn't that like life? That when you're doing what you need to be doing, when you're pushing hard, somebody tells you, just slow down. Don't push hard. You don't need to do that. And it's your ability to persevere that's going to allow you to win that race. We made it all the way up to the turnaround and started coming back. It was a huge, huge climb. And you start to come around, and you go right downhill. And that's a good thing because downhill, bike, positive, right? So I finally am getting a little bit of rest. Here's a little secret. I don't know if you want to broadcast this to the world. We're recording this, right? I'll just tell you a little triathlon, triathlete secret. On the bike, you got to go to the bathroom. Right? You drink a lot of water, <laughs> so you got to go to the bathroom. Well, it's a race. You can't stop. So what do you do? Well, you just go, right? But the key is to go when somebody else isn't behind you. So <laughs> I'm tucked in like this, right? Just like I was right there. I'm just flying like 35 miles an hour down this hill, feeling good. The first time in the whole bike that I'm like, I can do this. And I'm coming up on this athlete that's in front of me. Just I'm going hard. I'm going to go right by him. Right before I pass him, they decide it's time to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Not cool, right? Not cool. When I go by him, I get right in front of him, and guess what I do? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I didn't do that with me either. <laughs> but I did get on my face. And so <laughs> you get going. Um, you're fast forwarding. It's kind of fun. They have like the helicopter thing and, and they're filming you, right? And they got the Mustang that comes by and they're filming you. And so that's motivation. But at the end of the day, about mile 95, about mile 100, you're talking your six, seven hours into this race already. Your mind starts doing funny things to you again, right? And you got to keep pushing. But here's the key for me that day. Every time my mind went back to why I couldn't do this, where did I take it? I took it right back to this picture, right? I took it right back to this picture. And I remembered why I was doing it. And it gave me the energy to keep pushing, right? And to keep going. You get off that bike and you start to run. And the run goes like this. When you get off that bike, it was five and a half hours how long it took me to do that 112 mile bike. And you can't even walk, but you've got to run. And you just start going. And it's hard. It's really hard at first. But it gets easier. It gets easier. I think life's like that too. You persevere and it gets a little easier. The first 10 miles of the run looks kind of like this. You're a superstar. Woohoo! High fiving everybody. People lined up on both sides of the street. You're feeling pretty good about that. You're 10 miles in. You've only got 16.2 miles to go. And then you go back out to the lava fields. And you're out there with other athletes, but they're like skeletons, they're like ghosts. It's like they don't exist because they feel just as bad as you do. All your support crew, all your family, the cheering, the high fives, it's no longer. And you're out there on your own. And it's gut check time. It's time that you remember back to those 4.30 in the morning starts in that cold pool that you didn't like. That's why you did it, was for that moment in time. And you push and you endure. And you run out on this lava field, and you're on the Queen K Highway, you just keep running. And it's crazy what it does to your mind, because you know every step that you take, you're going to have to turn around and take that step back. And it seems counterintuitive, because you're just running out, and you're stopping, and you're turning back. It's like, why would I be running away from the finish line? It just doesn't make sense. You get to a point that's called the energy lab. In the energy lab, it's the opposite of what it says, because it sucks the life right out of you. 
it's about that 18 mile mark in the run. And that's, a, that's a, the true gut check time. You turn into the energy lab and it's desolate in there. It's hot, it's about three in the afternoon. The wind is there that you think would cool you down, it makes it worse because it's like a dryer just blowing right on you, always. You're sweating all over. All you can see is lava and athletes laying on the side of the road that couldn't make it. When I turned into the energy lab, I knew that that was a, a point where a lot of people break. I said, BS. Not only am I going to kill the energy lab, but I'm going to pick up my pace in the energy lab. Because it wasn't about me, it was about that kid. And that's where I found my energy. So that's exactly what we did. Turn around, make it to, that, to the turnaround point, and it's the home stretch. You come back, and as you come back into, into the, the town, into Kona, you feel that energy coming back. All of a sudden, those legs that were killing you start to feel better. All of a sudden, that fatigue and those voices that are telling you to stop go away. And now it's reward time. You go all the way into Kona. You run down the last mile stretch. And that's where your family is. And this is what it looks like. That's what the end looks like. I want to show you a quick video, if I can anyways, if this works. Let me just do from current slide. Oh, it didn't work. I'll show you later. I want to tell you what happened at the end of that and what came from this. I'll say it one more time. This is the third time. If you will get caught up in a cause that is not about you, and that it's about helping somebody else, miracles will take place. This was featured on NBC. It was about three weeks later, and I had a huge influx of emails that came in of people that said, I want to do that. I have a kid who has Down syndrome. I have a nephew. I just feel like I need to be involved. It was all different kinds from all over the world. And that's where Rod's Racing was created. Rod's Racing stands for Racing for Orphans with Down Syndrome. It was created a little over a year ago. So far, we have raised over $240,000. Because of the efforts of over 115 athletes right here, Racing all throughout the world, this happened. Every one of these kids you see here used to be orphans. And now they have a family to call their own. Remind, let me remind you, these children getting a family is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But the biggest blessing is the family that gets this kid. I know. I consider my son, outside of my relationship with my spouse, to be my greatest blessing I've ever experienced. And it's because of his inspiration that this was able to take place. We're growing. We have a, a plan to be able to uh, create a Rods Junior team. We actually just talked about this today. Um, like I said, we're, we're 14 months into this thing. I don't know where it's going to take us from now, but I do know that if we keep our intentions pure, we keep our heart in the right place, that miracles are going to continue to take place. And so I want to leave time for questions. Um, and I, I've had a meeting with a few students. There's been some great questions. Let's, let's chat. Let's, let's chat questions. Let's, you want me to tell you about... Getting, getting peed on more. <laughs> um, see if there's any other pictures in here I wanted to show you. No, that's pretty good right there. Let's fire away. I want to hear some questions.
And anything is game. Maybe those of you who have asked questions ask more. Yes? Doesn't King Quality Bite create bacon? No. You have what's called, uh, you have, uh, I just forgot what it was called. You have a special little, little uh, cream stuff you put on. It's the best. <laughs> <laughs> No problems there. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me talk about that. Uh, back to Mike's book, The Business of Heart, right? The Business of Heart. It's the idea of taking a for-profit model and basing it into a, into a charitable organization. So a huge part of how Rod's Racing grew and a big part of that donation came from me saying, how is it that I can take the traditional nonprofit model and kind of do away with that? Because I don't want to be the nonprofit that is dependent on somebody giving us donations, right? Of us saying, hey, we're helping kids. Would you spare us a few bucks, right? I just, we get those. We get hundreds of those. But that's not just how I want to roll with this. So I started saying, how can I make this a win for an organization? I was fortunate to get referred to Idaho Potatoes. It's the Idaho Potato Commission. Famous Idaho Potatoes, that's their job, is to promote the Idaho Potato Seal throughout the entire world. It's big business, I found out. And I had an opportunity to go and present before the board of the Idaho Potato Commission and tell them why they should give what I asked for was 50 grand, why they should give 50 grand to Rod's Racing. Big task, right? I stood before a board, and it was all potato farmers that were there. So I'm from Idaho, and these guys are tough dudes, right? Like, not the type of guys that you want to mess with. I'm from downtown Preston. I grew up a city boy, <laughs> all right? So I, didn't, I couldn't roll with these guys, OK? And so I'm before these, these individuals. And I caution you, I have to say exactly how they said it so you, you get the idea of how I was feeling at the time. But I stood up, and I told them the story that I just told you, right? And it was great. One of the crusty potato farmers raises his hand, loved the guy, he's now become a close friend of mine, cool guy, raised his hand. He said, son, that's great what you do for these kids, but what the hell does this have to do with Idaho potatoes? <laughs> and I looked him right in the eye, and I said, let me tell you what this has to do with Idaho potatoes. And I said, your biggest challenge, I'm guessing, is McDonald's. All right. Well, actually, they're a pretty good customer, right? I said, no. It's the perception that potatoes are bad for you. That's your biggest challenge. Okay. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but a huge fueling source for endurance athletes, elite athletes that race these types of events, are potatoes, in particular Idaho potatoes. And I said, do you know why? And they all raised their hand, absolutely. It's because of the complex carbohydrates. It gives you fuel immediately. And I said, exactly. And I will put 110 athletes racing in over 500 races throughout the world in the top races, the Ironman World Championship, the Boston Marathon, the New York Marathon. I will put them out there with your seal right on their chest that says, fueled by famous Idaho potatoes because that's how we are fueled, is by your potatoes. And they said, sign me up. And I got Idaho Potatoes as a sponsor. That's an example of the for-profit, non-profit model. It wasn't about me going to Idaho Potatoes and telling them why they should give me money because I help kids. It was about me going to Idaho Potatoes and telling them why they should give us money because it's going to help them. And oh, by the way, it helps kids too, which is a big plus. That's an example of, of how we've got this thing rolling. Okay? I run this very much like a business. This is not a go, I was going to say, go save the world. It kind of is, I guess. But it's, it's a business, right? So how has it affected your professional career? Are you still able to do both, or have you completely switched over? No, no. I, uh, that's a controversy for me. I love what I do professionally. Uh, I love it. And I, uh, I'm not giving that up anytime soon. I just, I love it. But the nice thing is there's a lot of other hours in the day 
that I can be involved with the other aspect of this, okay? Meaning the rods racing. Let me give you an example of how this works in combining the two together. I work in financial services, okay? So this goes back to the business of heart, the business of heart. I work in financial services. A big part of financial services is life insurance. A big part of our profit center is to sell more life insurance policies. In 2011, 11, we sold just over 1,600 life insurance policies. Pretty good thing for our firm, right? In 2012, we had the goal to sell 2,000 life insurance policies amongst all of our reps. That's a pretty big jump. How are we going to pull this off? Let's incorporate the business of heart. At our annual meeting, we gave out great awards. We recognized our top producers. We did some wonderful, wonderful things for them. And in the end, we announced our goal to increase our case count to over 2,000 cases. Over 2,000 cases. People are like, good for you. Good luck with that. <laughs> okay. We then had a family who lives down in South Jordan come on stage. We had them tell their story. They told their story how they felt inclined to adopt a child who has Down syndrome from Russia, and that one of the biggest challenges that they faced was coming up with the $40,000 to pay for this adoption. The president of the company at the time went forward before everybody and said, for every life insurance policy you place this year, we will donate $5 to this family. If you place 2000 this year, we will double it. To 10. Now it wasn't about these producers going out and making an income. It wasn't about them going out and achieving a goal or hitting an award that's all geared towards one person. Now they were caught up in a cause. Now they started to understand the business of heart. Now it was about taking this family and helping them to bring their little girl Victoria home. At the end of the year, we placed over 2,000 or 2,000 policies, and this family brought this little girl home. That's the business of heart. And so, how I incorporate my professional world, how I incorporate the nonprofit side, would be an example like that. Other questions? Good. I want to share with you one last thing. Um, from all of this, much good has come. More miracles have taken place that were inadvertent, that were indirectly related to my benefit. Okay. Most recently, and I'll give you two examples. Most recently, I was contacted by a company, a Fortune 100 company, and asked if I would be open to interviewing for a position as president and CEO of their Intermountain West division for Mass Mutual. This was last year, okay? Last year about this time. They told me that there was a lot of candidates that were involved, a lot of internal candidates that had more experience than I did and so forth. And I thought, there's no way. <laughs> I'll interview, but I felt like I was more of like one of those, like they were just giving me the interview to get a couple more people <laughs> involved to make it so when they actually chose the guy that everybody else felt better about it. And I thought, I'll give it a shot. And I uh, went through the interview process and learned of who the other candidates were. And they were good, good men with more experience. And they would have done a phenomenal job for us. They really would have. At the end of the day, guess why I got this job? It was because of the work that we'd been doing with Rods Racing. That was the differentiator. That was the reason why they chose me over the very, very good men that were qualified as well. Is that why I did Rods Racing? No. But is that not an incredible benefit? Okay. The last example that I'll give you just happened recently. It's a smaller example, but it's profound and vital to me. 
with Rod's Racing, it's a family thing for us. My kids are very involved with it. And sometimes I wonder if like, we're cheating them on other things that they could be doing when we're taking them to races and organizing things. And that's what we talk about at the dinner table and so forth. We went to Brinley's, my daughter's parent-teacher conference. And the teacher, her second grade teacher, is getting close to retirement. And she told us what a wonderful girl Brindley was, which I'm thinking, my wife, nice job, you did it, honey. And how smart and everything else. But she said the thing that really stands out with Brindley is how much she loves her brother, Nash, and how much she loves Down syndrome. In fact, she tells us all about orphans with Down syndrome all the time. Her whole class knows all about it. And I'm thinking, is this a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> and the teacher, with tears in her eyes, says, when I retire soon, I want to come to work for Rod's Racing. I think I'm so thankful for my daughter that that's where her heart is as well. Now, was that the reason why I did Rod's Racing? No. But what a special, special blessing and benefit that came from Brinley being involved with this. And so again, I'll say it one more time. When you're caught up in causes that are for good to help other people, it will bless your life and miracles will take place. I appreciate your time tonight.